Um, good afternoon and thanks for joining us today. Um, Andy and I wanted to give you an update following our press conference together, which was a couple of weeks ago. And last time we talked about two main things, the role that mayors and local government can play in the economic recovery and how we can build back better from this crisis. And on both of these things, we've had significant progress. Indeed, last Friday, uh, Andy and I, along with the M9 group of Metro mayors, spoke to the Prime Minister and Boris Johnson asked us to work with the government to lead the economic recovery in our respective areas. And this is exactly the kind of positive response that we were hoping for. And it's welcome that the government see that whilst the recovery will be a national effort, of course, mayors are well placed to work with councils and other local stakeholders to meet the specific needs of our communities. It'll be a long time until we all return to something approaching a normal life again, but by working together, we can ensure that we ultimately emerge from this period um, as strong as it's possible to do, given the economic upheaval that we face. So today we wanted to focus on the, the second area from our last press conference and talk a bit more about building back better. It's fair to say that since our last conversation, the idea of building back better seems to have caught fire and we've been blown away by the support that the ideas received across the business community, across trade unions and politicians from all different political persuasions. Um, but now we want to talk about how we can take building back better to the next level. So today, along with Andy, I'm joined by Lou Cordwell, who's the founder and CEO of Magnetic North and co-chair of the Greater Manchester LEP, and Laura Pye, who's a member of the Liverpool City Region LEP, uh, LEP board and director of National Museums Liverpool, who are launching the Build Back Better campaign for us. So I'll start, hopefully, um, if technology allows us, to hand over to Lou. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for that. I think I think our technology is working. Let's let's give it a go. So um, afternoon, everyone. So clearly, um, as Steve says, we're continuing to focus on battling the consequences of the COVID-19 crisis. And as a city region and as a country, um, we remain focused on supporting those um, with the most significant and immediate needs um, impacted most by the situation. Uh, and also on building back a safe environment for the people of Greater Manchester and the North as, as we begin to think about lifting lockdown. But what we also know is that the earlier we begin um, thinking about what comes next, then the better our chances of delivering a strong and successful recovery will be. So as we start to plan our recovery, um, we know that it's important to pause and reflect on what we've seen and what we've learned in these really difficult um, past few weeks and months. So we've seen that many of the people who play a really vital role in keeping our lives ticking along are actually working in the poorest conditions and often for the lowest pay. We've learned that it is possible to quickly and radically improve the quality of the air we breathe just by changing our own behaviour. And we've realised that the health and the well-being of our people and our economy are in fact intrinsically interconnected. We've been amazed by people's ability to evolve and adapt to a very different world almost overnight. And we've been moved by the kindness of strangers and our neighbours alike, reminding us um, if we needed reminding of what the real power of local communities um, is. So as a society, we're experiencing an unprecedented moment in time and we've been given a rare chance to step off the treadmill and consider our lives and our futures. In a recent survey, as you'll have seen, only 9% of people wanted to return to life just as it was pre-COVID-19. And what that tells us is that actually our old normal didn't really prioritise the things that most of us actually value the most. So as Einstein famously said, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. And we think this is our chance not to go back to normal, but forward to better. So perhaps a crisis of this magnitude enables us to reimagine our world and provides us with the opportunity to redesign it 
And we're intending to grasp that opportunity with both hands, as, as you'll have heard already from Steve and Andy. So we believe by working together, that's business, public sector, third sector and citizens, we can build an economy that's better for everyone in Greater Manchester and for our northern neighbours. A future where business can still be profitable and sustainable, but not at any cost. Where the people who provide our food and clean our workplaces and empty our bins and deliver our parcels and look after us when we're sick, the services we too often took for granted are treated and paid at a level that reflects the roles that they perform. Where budding entrepreneurs of any age and stage and postcode can grab the new opportunities that will be presented by the changing needs and behaviours and the new businesses we'll see emerging. And where people can be employed in meaningful jobs and pursue their dream careers, but still have time at the end of the day to see friends and family. Where we'll see young people fulfil true potential, not pay the biggest price. And where being digitally enabled means more fulfilling and better paid work, not displacing costly people with inexpensive machines. And one, we hope, where the world can watch and learn from us about how a growing and productive economy can bring a positive outcome for investors, but also for the planet. So in this emerging new world, the pillars of our local industrial strategy here in Greater Manchester, that's clean growth, digital, health innovation and advanced materials suddenly seem more pertinent than ever before. And they're providing us with a really strong strategic framework on which we can build back. And we intend to build that process of rewriting the goals and the rules for the new economy now and together. So from today, you'll find a Build Back Better um, section of our website, which you can see on the screen now. And that allows us to invite businesses, those businesses who share our ambition, to get in touch. And what we want to hear from people is uh, what better looks like to them and help shape that, and also how they want to be part of building back a better future with us together. So I'm going to hand on to um, Laura Pye now, um, who's going to say a few words around culture and the economy. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks, Lee, for handing over. I'm the Visitor Economy Lead uh, for the Liverpool City Region. And uh, as Liverpool City Region LEP, we're keen to work with businesses on a Build Back Better plan for every business and for every sector so that we can work together to create a plan that benefits everybody. And like Manchester, we'll be uh, putting up some details on the Liverpool City Region LEP website later on today on how you can register your interest and feedback that stuff to us. Uh, so I'd encourage everybody to do that and to engage with us on how we can, as all sectors, build back better. In terms of the visitor economy, the visitor economy is a massively important part of the of the economy in Liverpool City region. It's worth about 4.9 billion to us and employs uh, 57,000 people. And it's probably one of the sectors that's been most hardly hit by COVID. At the moment, we're estimating that even if restrictions lasted until just the end of June, it would have cost the city region 1.3 billion. And it's going to hit us as well at a time when it's an economy that's really based on seasonality. And that's going to be a big issue for us moving forward as well. So in terms of where we are currently, obviously the lockdown implications are difficult for all of us and difficult for every sector. But given that we expect probably the leisure and tourism sector to be one of the last to come out of lockdown and the last to recover significantly, this is going to have a major impact on our city region, not just Liverpool City, but Southport and Wirral that have strong tourism sectors that are based very strongly on a summer season that potentially we're going to lose all of. So we've been looking at what, how we can support that sector and what that looks like and how we change into what will become a new normal. And we're looking at things such as localism and how we can all work together to support local businesses much more strongly. I think we've seen a lot of that in lockdown when some of the big chain businesses um, shut down completely. We saw local pubs and local restaurants offering takeaway services. And in terms of cultural entrepreneurship as well, looking at how the cultural sector can work with others to support in terms of retail offer, um, as well as as well as the kind of visitor economy more broader than that. Digital innovation is also going to be key for us moving forward. And I think we've seen a lot of that. We've actually, interestingly, within the cultural sector, probably more people are engaging in cultural activity during lockdown. Uh, because of its accessibility in terms of being able to watch on television and being able to engage online and being able to engage with people in a way that we've never done before. But to have those cultural experiences through a different medium is something that we can't lose sight of when we come out of recovery and when we come out of lockdown and into recovery. The sector has changed for us massively. 
and we need to take advantage of those situations and, and work on them to create a new normal that takes advantage of those best things that we've learned during during the crisis. Um, I think as well, one of the other things we've seen during the crisis is just the importance of culture more broadly, uh, not just to the visitor economy sector, which is vitally important for, but in terms of the effect on people's mental health and in terms of their well-being. And certainly I think we've seen more people engage in cultural activity than perhaps have done in the past. And that's something we need to think about moving forward. We lived in a very fast pacing lives where maybe we didn't have time to read the book or see the play or take part in some painting or do a cultural activity of some description. And I think we've all seen the benefit on our mental health of being having some time to think about those things and to use culture as a way of engaging with communities and tackling isolation. So for, for us in Liverpool City region, we need the community, the business community to back us with the Build Back Better campaign and to work with us to tell us how that will look uh, and give us some ideas. But from a visitor economy point of view, we think we've learned some lessons already that will be important to us moving forward and that we can use in the future. I'm going to hand back to Steve, I think. Thanks, Laura. Um, hopefully again, I'm, I'm back live. Um, thanks to Lou and Laura for setting the scene. Hopefully you'll be able to see now that um, we're starting to build momentum and this is more than just a slogan. For me, building back better means two things. Um, how do we fix things that we know were wrong with the economy in the first place and, and society pre-pandemic, like the underfunding of public services, precarious and low play low paid uh, employment and the regional unbalanced economy that we had uh, very unequal and how do we build on the good things that have come out of this incredibly difficult period such as flexible work and um, protecting our planet and even a daily exercise regime now why should we build back better well this is not just a, a nice to have add on. It's an economic necessity in a post COVID UK economy. And if we don't seize the opportunity to build back better, we risk a slide back to the poor practices that a decade of austerity created. So we need to get this right if we want to avoid modal shift with people switching from public transport to jumping back in the cars. Um, a return to high carbon emissions with poor air quality and the associated health issues that that causes. And as Laura and Lou just mentioned, businesses shutting with a return to mass unemployment. Now we can do better than this. And in all honesty, we have to do better than this. Emerging evidence is showing that factors like social deprivation, um, income, air quality, density of housing, all contribute to COVID infection rates. So we're calling on the government to acknowledge that different areas are being affected differently by the pandemic and will require different support packages throughout the recovery. So at the heart of Build Back Better, there has to be a commitment by governments to accelerate and expand what they call a levelling up agenda, give more power through devolution to local governments, to businesses and to workers. Throughout this whole period, there's been a general recognition, I think, that the value of many people's work has simply not been reflected in pay packets. But without our minimum wage heroes, so the cleaners, the porters, the shop workers, the refuse collectors, postmen and women, and many others, the country wouldn't have stood a chance in this crisis. And yet many of these essential staff are not even paid the real living wage. But no sector has been previously as undervalued by government quite as badly as the social care sector. As the number of cases in care homes has spiked, our care workers have continued to go above and beyond and disproportionately likely to be female or BAME. 
the median care worker earns three pounds per hour less than other key workers and as you'll see hopefully from a slide over 46 percent of care workers in the northwest are paid below the real living wage compared with about 20 percent in other sectors so these silent heroes are due a pay rise and it shouldn't have taken a global crisis or the death of frontline workers for some to realize that that's the case so after we've beaten this virus there can be no more kicking the can down the road on social care reform as andy referred to last week we can start that reform by giving our carers the pay rise that they deserve and we also need this to see this sort of trend mirrored in other sectors like retail for instance as the next slide will show over 50 percent of retail workers in the northwest are paid less than the real living wage yet throughout this pandemic ensuring that people have access to food medicines clothes and sort of the more mundane things like desks and chairs for our home offices that were all um, now firmly ensconced in that's kept the country running so surely it's time that this is reflected also in people's pay packets and as you'll hopefully know myself and andy are trying to do something about this we're working with our businesses and trade unions to develop employment charters to encourage the payment of the real living wage and to secure long-term employment and i hope the government will use these charters as a model for the rest of the country they can roll out um, for others to follow now just on the final point before i hand over to andy we need urgent action on skills and this has probably been the number one issue raised with me when i've talked to local businesses and it will be the primary issue i think or one of them as we start to begin the recovery process now Probably there's never been a more important time to invest in skills as skills shortages and gaps will hold back any fragile economic recovery. So if we want to see the growth in low carbon industries, for instance, we need to be training people for the jobs in the green industrial revolution. You know, things like retrofitting homes will become huge. Modular build will be something of significance in developing that talent pipeline for those emerging industries will be essential in this brave new world we emerge into. And things like our Mersey Tidal Power Project will be exemplars of doing this. So the skills agenda is an area where national government, but national government working with combined authorities and our LEPs can make a huge difference because now more than ever, we need to give hope to our young people and i, I trust um, you can see another slide which shows the fall in apprenticeship numbers there's evidence that many apprentices are being laid off as a result of the lockdown in fact every week has provided data that on the last day of april 304 providers said that they had between them planned 13,700 and something starts in the month, but they were 80% down on those forecasts and 137 of them said that they hadn't even started a single apprentice. And that's why I asked Boris Johnson on Friday to look at an apprenticeship programme for us, uh, including a furlough scheme for apprentices and I think that was in uh, something that everybody on the M9 call agreed with. Now, this week, Andy and I were supposed to be facing our electorates, but due to the coronavirus, those elections have been delayed until next May. But one of my key pledges in that campaign was a young person's guarantee. And this was the offer of a job, an apprenticeship or a training opportunity for everyone under the age of 25 who'd been out of work for six months. Yesterday, the TUC called for a similar scheme based on the Future Jobs Fund to be introduced nationwide, which would support young people during the recovery phase. 
But I hope that the Chancellor will look at my call and these other calls and work we um, as a combined authority and I know Greater Manchester will we're we'll going, going to be drawing up plans for how a scheme such as this could be introduced so that Rishi Sunak can consider these proposals. It's a big issue for us, I know, and um, I'm sure others will touch on it and we'll answer any questions, but I'm now going to hand over to Andy, who's going to talk more about how we can take this existing agenda forward. So, Andy, over to you if it works. It does, I think, uh, Steve, the technology just about works down the M62. Uh, and I'd like to thank you and uh, Laura uh, for joining us uh, this afternoon. It's brilliant to have this level of collaboration between uh, the two uh, city regions. And I'd particularly like to thank Lou for turning some kind of vague thoughts that Steve and I had uh, a couple of weeks ago into a, a real positive, collaborative, inclusive campaign and, and call to action uh, supported by the Greater Manchester Lep that's inviting everybody, individuals, businesses, councils, CAs, government, uh, to rethink how they work, to rethink what they do, to see if we can, uh, as the slogan says, build back uh, better. And on that call with the Prime Minister on Friday, I was saying to him that, you know, we've tried to preserve a degree of national unity in the response phase to the virus. You know, let's keep that going now. Uh, and I think that's what the country needs to give it the hope that uh, Lou, uh, Laura and Steve were, were talking about. And it's in that spirit of national unity that I very much am supporting our LEP and I'm sure Steve is supporting his LEP in putting forward this Build Back Better campaign today. It's got to be uh, cross country, uh, cross party, uh, cross industry. It's really got to be for, for everybody to get involved and uh, define what they want it uh, to be. And uh, we are encouraging people to sign up on the website because I need to know the names of those businesses in Greater Manchester who want to, to work uh, with us. The reason being change is inevitable. And what we've got to try and do is make sure that change uh, works for people and if possible uh, helps them have a better life at the end of it. Let's take a very practical example and that is the structure of the um, the working day and the working week. Uh, capacity constraints on public transport going forward mean that Steve and I will be asking business to work with us uh, to, to, to rethink how people come in and out of both cities uh, on a, a given uh, working day. We can't return to normal, even if we if we wanted to. But actually, the traditional nine to five working day in Greater Manchester doesn't work particularly well for us because we all are familiar with the levels of of congestion on our roads and the stress that that creates, but also the the, the air quality, uh, the poor air quality uh, too. So this is an opportunity to to rethink with our businesses how we restructure the working day. Uh, so that we do uh, give people more home working, more flexible working, uh, staggered start and end time to the working day, which can be so much better for people if they're balancing uh, work and home life. So it's one example of, of how building back better can really help us all manage congestion and air quality, but also give our residents uh, a much better quality uh, of life. And that's a very specific example um, that we need to, to work on with our businesses. I said at the beginning, you know, this is for everybody to challenge what they do. And you know, my organisation is, is no different. Uh, so over the last few days, our cycling and walking commissioner, Chris Boardman, has been working with our 10 districts to see if we can uh, challenge uh, what we are uh, while doing and see if we can accelerate our, our ambitions around active uh, travel. We don't want to be asking anybody to do things that we're not prepared to do ourselves. So we are prepared to challenge our own processes. And just to give you an example of how Build Back Better isn't a sort of pie in the sky, vague ambition, but is actually soon to be a reality. Chris will make an announcement tomorrow about some immediate changes we will be making uh, to um, the, the highways network across Greater Manchester uh, to uh, give more space to cyclists and pedestrians, as well as accelerating the delivery of the infrastructure that we planned uh, through the B network, a very tangible example of what Build Back Better might uh, mean. 
I um, just want to um, develop the theme about partnership uh, with the government, and this is a slightly more challenging uh, point. So hopefully a slide uh, will be appearing uh, soon, which will uh, which will make the point that I'm uh, about to, um, to to stress, which is the reality of this virus has been that it has targeted the most deprived communities um, aggressively and it's hit those communities hardest. Um, that was evident in data that was published um, last uh, last week. Um, hopefully the, si the slide will show you um, authorities uh, in Greater Manchester and the Liverpool city region uh, and their levels of deprivation but also uh, the number of COVID-19 deaths per 100,000 population. As you can see, there is a pretty stark uh, north-south uh, divide uh, on that uh, graph. So the virus is hitting the poorest communities uh, the hardest. But let's go to another another graph. You know, we um, um, can see the effect, the, the, the link between deprivation and incidence of the virus. But last week, um, the government um, made allocations to our councils uh, and removed the deprivation weighting from the funding that it's been given uh, to, to councils. So you can see there some of the councils in Liverpool and Greater Manchester in terms of the, uh, the, the cut that they experienced compared to some of those councils where the virus is not uh, as, as prevalent. And so the risk is clear, I think, from this, um, uh, from, from these two uh, sets of figures. It's that it's not just that the most deprived communities will be hit hardest by the health crisis. They then may be hit hardest again by the economic uh, crisis uh, that is coming. And it's not been lost on a number of our council leaders that the Secretary of State said yesterday that the government wouldn't be picking up all of the costs that councils had lost as a as a result uh, of this. So we make that point because we do have to preserve a sense of national unity here and we do have to hold the government to account for the levelling up uh, promises that it has made. You know, I said to Prime Minister on the phone on Friday, you know, it's not just the case that levelling up has to come back, it has to come back with a vengeance in this period and the government needs now to accelerate its ambitions around levelling up the country. And that means giving uh, significant resource and power to the Liverpool city region, Greater Manchester and others uh, to now with, to face up to what lies ahead of us and build a, a better future, recognising that it can't just be about promises of infrastructure to arrive in 10, 20 or 30 years time. This has got to be about investing in our people now, as Steve was just saying, with regards to the risk of a lost uh, generation. We need to think differently to the way we've thought uh, in uh, the past, not allowing young people to lose hope or, or older workers to end up on the scrap heap. We've got to get serious about job creation and job creation in areas where we know the country uh, needs to get uh, stronger, particularly in the digital economy and in the green economy. Things that we've been sort of saying we should do but now we need to do it and we really need to raise uh, raise our game. So let's take an obvious one, the housing crisis. Um, throughout this period, so many people will have found it much harder to stay at home than others because of the poor quality uh, of much of the housing in both of our city regions, particularly in the, the private rented uh, sector. Uh, many people don't have a decent uh, living uh, space the overcrowded nature of our housing, I think, is linked to prevalence of the virus. And of course, you know, all communities in the Northwest don't have the same levels of digital connectivity, are not able to work at home in the same way uh, as, as others. So it seems to me to be obvious that now is a moment to free up our uh, combined authorities and councils to build the new homes, the thousands of new homes for social rent that Greater Manchester and the Liverpool City region desperately need. And in my view, those should be zero carbon uh, modular uh, homes, opening up a whole new industry uh, to particularly our, our young people, working with our colleges to give them the skills to build uh, those new homes. Alongside that, we should be retrofitting all of those properties. Both of our city regions have 
accelerated ambitions for carbon neutrality. We know we're going to have to retrofit all domestic properties across the Northwest. So why not get on with it now? Give us the funding to help put in place the training to bring through uh, a generation of young people with those uh, skills. It could start with public investment to kickstart the modular home industry or the, 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 um, the retrofitting industry. Then, of course, the private sector can play an increasing role as those industries uh, get going. And a, and a further one, of course, is the laying of digital infrastructure. In both city regions, there is already work underway, but clearly now is an obvious time to accelerate it. So, Steve, I'll finish on, on this point, and you, you touched uh, on it. You know, as we go towards this weekend, I think we'll all be thinking, won't we, about um, the country as it was 75 years ago. And, you know, if we think back to what was going on then, of course, you know, people then had been through something much worse than what we uh, are going through uh, now, much worse on, on every uh, level. And while they were beginning to celebrate the end of the war, they were also getting ready uh, to vote for a radical change to the way we provide healthcare uh, in this uh, country. So uh, as we come through this and we think about what lies beyond, you know, I hope people will be inspired by that spirit and uh, similarly demand a radical change in the way we provide care uh, in this country and also look after those people who provide uh, care. And I hope that demand will be for an NHS style social care system that properly trains and pays its staff and of course provides proper care uh, for all uh, people who need it. I think our ambition should be clear. If we want a 21st century health and care system, it needs to be able to support people with dementia as well as it currently treats cancer. I think that is an ambition a national ambition we should set coming out of this. And I think it would put huge meaning behind Build Back Better if, as a country, we now resolved uh, all together to say that is what we are going to build coming out of this. Ross, I think we've gone over to you, aren't we, as moderator? Yep, more than happy to pick up the questions. So we've had a fantastic amount of questions in from colleagues in the media. Um, um, a reasonably short amount of time to take them in, so uh, we'll try and get through them as quick as we can. Uh, I'm going to take the first two questions from David Collins, who submitted at 12.15pm, uh, so they should be at the top. And I'm going to bring in Andy, uh, sorry, Steve uh, first, and then I'll bring in Andy. Uh, the question is, uh, do you get the sense that the government has completely ruled out a regional or geographical approach to lifting the lockdown? What do you think of the idea of imposing lockdowns to specific towns and cities and regions who are showing a spike in COVID cases? And the question below that is going forward, do you see this as an end to London's dominance as the UK's economic powerhouse? Do you believe London will ever be the same? Uh, and there's another um, part of the question about uh, the relationship between London and the regions and how that will be affected. So Steve, if you want to take that one first and then hand over to Andy. OK, um, let's start with the um, whether there would, would be a regional approach to um, unlocking the lockdown. Uh, and I just can't see how that pragmatically could work. So I doubt it very much. I think the government did consider it. Uh, what governments do, as we know, is they throw things out and they try to look at what the feedback on that might be. and. Um, I, I'm pretty certain that with the pushback from um, areas outside of the South, that they may well have abandoned that. And it's the wrong approach anyway. Um, just imagine, I think Andy said this, um, if we in the Northwest were watching pictures on the TV screens of people in pubs and clubs in London, and what that would mean genuinely to the social fabric of our areas. You know, what would it mean for law and order? What would it mean for a whole host of different things? So I, I don't mean that to go. We, we sort of moved on to a sectoral um, approach then. Uh, I think that is also being abandoned by governments for the standards based approach. And I think this 
is a better way of doing things. If we can make sure that workplaces are safe to work in, if we can then sort out some of the public transport issues, and I noticed there's a question or two on public transport, so I won't stray too far into that because we'll answer those questions. But if we get the public transport off a right, so we can get people to and from their workplaces and then ensure that when they are in their workplaces, that as far as reasonably practicable, we take away the risk of coronavirus. And that will mean method statements, safe working method statements uh, to be put in place first for PPE and for other things like screens and all sorts of, of issues to, to be in place. We could then have a standard based approach to the restart of the economy. And just on one last point, because you did mention the London thing, um, I've always had this uh, grudging respect for what happens in London. They, they are a fantastic economy, very healthy. And, and anything that we do in the Northwest that is positive for us shouldn't be necessarily a detriment for them. Leveling up is not about London coming down so that they're where we are. It's about us being given the opportunities and the flexibilities to raise our economies to a same or similar sort of standard as them. So I don't believe that they have to lose out if we're to gain. I think government need to give us the powers and resources. And if they do that, then it will be for us to determine what's in the best interest so that we can start to build economies locally that can compete against the South, um, against London, but also now in the, the sort of the wider um, economy, because we're going to have a, a worldwide uh, economy that's very different than the one that we walked into just a few weeks ago. I'll bring in Andy on that point as well. Yeah, just just quickly, Ross, to, to add, I agree obviously with everything Steve uh, said. Um, a local release from lockdown or even a regional release is a non-starter as far as I'm concerned and I'm disappointed to see it getting uh, more um, more coverage. Um, we've made it repeatedly clear that it wouldn't be acceptable uh, to us, it would be unfair, it, it would break the sense of national unity that I was uh, talking about. Uh, I agree very much with Steve, standards led or safety led is the way is the way to go and all of the country moving uh, together uh, to create that that sense of, of common cause and then to get build back better off on the right on the right foot. So um, I, I know if government is still thinking about it, I just think I need to send a clear message that I find it unacceptable and we've worked hard to you know, work constructively with the government and I, I would hope that they would listen to our voice uh, on this. On the question about London, yeah, I agree with everything Steve said, but there is a risk, as I, as I said before, of regional divides widening as a result uh, of this. And it is a little concerning what we've seen on uh, government funding uh, over recent days. We showed you the figures on our councils. Um, you know, we've got to recognise that the economic challenge will be greater uh, in uh, the north. And therefore, you know, those promises that were made really do need now to be honoured and they need to work with us in that spirit of partnership uh, to get that infrastructure uh, laid, uh, be it for cycling and walking, digital infrastructure, building those new homes. They need to give hope to a new generation uh, and they need to give us the devolved power over skills to make sure that we can work quickly to get our young people into those opportunities. Now, you know, it's clear to me, you know, we're not asking for the government to do anything that, that they haven't promised themselves. They promised us a Northern powerhouse. They said they would level up. They, they talk about devolution, but now they need to put meaning behind all of those promises. Thanks, Andy. I'm going to go straight into a question uh, from Dan because I'm just conscious of time. Um, it's Dan Whelan at Place Northwest um, to Andy and then we'll take Steve. What do you predict the future of the built environment will be like post COVID in GM and Liverpool City region? Do you anticipate a slowdown in development and what can be done to prevent smaller towns from being left behind? And what guidance or advice do you have for the development community um, regarding Build Back Better? It's a good question. I think we might need to accelerate some of our ambitions around town centres, um, town centres as residential uh, centres rather than retail centres. 
I think the high street is going to uh, take a knock as a result of this, but let's not see it as a as a negative. You know, I can see a, a new um, future for our uh, proud outlying towns that is one of modern. Uh, it could be modular, but doesn't have to be, but modern, uh, affordable housing, uh, cl more closely connected to public transport with uh, excellent digital infrastructure to support it. You know, that's We've been talking a lot about these things. I think our message today is let us do it now. We have the Stockport Mayoral Development Corporation. Uh, already it's proven it can be a vehicle to, to, to accelerate this kind of change. Let's get on and do it and recognise that our towns could really hit hard times if they're left to drift into worse, as, as Steve said uh, before. So we don't necessarily know what the future holds, but you know, Build Back Better is about saying, well, let's, let's approach it positively and get on with building a better future because actually if we leave things and we let things slide then i i guess you know our problems are going to uh, to to multiply thanks andy i'll bring Stephen on that question as well yeah obviously um similarly ross in, in agreement with andy I, I think um what i tried to do this is obviously um 12 months ago or more before any of this started was to give some of our councils um double devolution, if you like, give them some money themselves to decide on what's um, best for individual areas. So I gave a pot of six million pounds to our local authorities and I said, go away and redesign, you know, repurpose, uh, reinvent what your um, town centres are about. And they, they chose individual areas and those plans were, were developing nicely. Um, I'm not sure where they're up to because of all, all that's happening now, but I'm not sure um, that necessarily they have to stop. We might may just have to revisit them, but that will be about the things that Andy spoke about. Uh, what, what does it mean, connectivity, both in the public transport sense, but also in the digital sense, and um, with communities working more closely, I think, than ever before, this might be an opportunity for them. So um, I think it's a Good question. I think the built environment itself will be very different. I think buildings will be different. I think there'll be more space uh, and I believe that that's going to be important in the design of buildings. Uh, I was the first in the country outside of London to have a design champion um, who is a sterling prize win winning architect. And I think things like that will become more important as we look to design some of these issues out of the built environment for the future because this believe me is not the last pandemic that most people will face in their lifetimes thank you very much steve um, andy smith from wish wire and terror fm uh, asks what approach are you hoping to see from the pm on sunday when he outlines a plan to ease the lockdown do you have anything further to add uh, to what you've already said steve and then we'll bring andy in after that one um, not an awful lot. I, I hope that what he, he does say is he recognises that we have to put these um, assurances in place before we start to actually determine what bits are unlocked. There needs to be a lot of work and there needs to be um, safety at its heart. We, we have to reduce the risk for frontline workers, those people who will be going back to work. And as I say, the knock on consequences of this to the public transport system are enormous. Uh, and uh, I know we're going to touch on that, so I'll leave it there. Thanks, Nandy. Did you have anything to add? Briefly, Ross, um, I would love to hear him say that, um, you know, COVID is not going to sort of derail the whole levelling up agenda. In fact, it's going to come back and it's coming back more strongly. Um, I think that's what he should say, because I think there is an opportunity uh, to, to do that. Um, and, you know, I think we've been clear about a standards led or a safety led approach uh, to lockdown, which we, we could both support. And I suppose the last thing I would say is, you know, to, to kind of come back to the spirit of this campaign that, you know, has led the, the Greatest Manchester Lep to, to, to sort of launch it today and call for people to join it. You know, th this, this call to people to join goes right up to the PM. You know, uh, build back better is something is it's about hope. It's about positivity. It's about a kind of sense that the future can be better. I think the country desperately needs this at the moment. It really needs it. There's a real yearning for it. And Steve and I really kind of felt that when we kind of just 
put, put the idea out there, as he said at the start, the, the response was, was was overwhelming in many ways. So, you know, if everyone starts speaking to that, you know, the country could hopefully feel like finally it's had a bit of a reset and it's on the right path. And I, I would like him to, to say, right, I hear what they're saying. We're, we're all we're all behind the same thing. And that would that would be great. Fantastic. I'm going to go to a question uh, from Dave Guest at 12.38 from Northwest Tonight. Kevin Fitzpatrick's also asked a similar question and it's just for Andy. Uh, Greater Manchester Councils are to invest £250 million into Manchester Airport Group to help it survive the pandemic. Given as owners, they're also likely to receive very little dividend, if any, is going to have a significant impact on council spending. Why should our councils provide this support to the airport? And just to say, um, I've not forgot about Nick Terrell's question. We'll come to that one next. Because it's fundamental, not just to the economy of Greater Manchester. Manchester Airport is fundamental to the economy of the whole of the north of England. And I'm sure you know, Steve would back that up alongside, of course, John Lennon Airport. But you know, Manchester is, is crucial because of those long haul links between the north and Asia and North America and, and elsewhere. So. You know, we have to get um, the airport um, uh, through this. And obviously, as, as shareholders, the councils have to do what, what shareholders uh, do. You know, they protect their investment. And, you know, obviously, the investment produces a dividend in good times, that, but it also it comes with a, uh, a challenge in, in more difficult uh, times. So they're not doing anything other than any investor would do. I suppose the, 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 the challenge is more towards the government, you know, aviation hasn't had a deal yet. Airports are critical to the regional economy, not just in the north, but in all parts of, of the UK. And, you know, if we're going to get this recovery off on the right foot, we do need to go into this in the spirit of partnership and not leave councils that are really struggling to, um, you know, to manage this. You know, we heard yesterday that um, the Secretary of State said he wouldn't cover other costs that councils had lost as a, as a result of this. Well, I consider that to be unfair because the way in which local government finance has been handled in recent years, decades even, has forced councils to be more entrepreneurial. In fact, they've been encouraged to do that. So why punish them now uh, when they've been forced down that path uh, and we've hit a, a situation that was beyond anyone's control? I think the key point is recognise the crucial nature of these airports, the regional economy. I did raise Manchester Airport on the call uh, with the Prime Minister. He said it, that he recognised how critical it was uh, to reviving the economy of the north of England. Uh, what we're asking for is a fair partnership between national and local government uh, to underpin a critical asset for the whole of the north of England. Manchester Airport is a gateway to the whole of the north. Thanks, Andy. Um, I'm going to go to Nick Terrell's question at 12.35 uh, as, uh, for Andy and Steve. Um, have the government provided any more guidance on how public transport systems in Manchester and Liverpool should adapt as the UK moves through the next few months? And a second part of that question, um, will we see the types of major changes on roads to prioritise pedestrians and cyclists that have taken place in other cities in Europe? And I know you've touched on that already, um, but if you'd any uh, on the first part of the question, and then we'll bring in Steve. Yeah, just briefly then, Ross, um, we uh, are going to say more about this tomorrow. So yes is the answer, but I'm afraid you'll have to wait until tomorrow for some of the detail on the reprioritisation of, of road uh, space. On the uh, question about public transport, well, we have had uh, a funding package now for Metrolink, uh, which covers three quarters of the cost that we faced in running Metrolink through this period with no fare box. Um, Again, it's one of those issues where we need to say to the government, you know, please, the Treasury can't work in its old way of nitpicking here and penny pinching there. You know, recovery is going to need to be funded because if it gets off into a faltering start, we're not going to be able to build back better. The public transport system is crucial uh, to, to bringing both of these city regions back. Uh, and it doesn't uh, mean we're just going to have a bit of funding for the short term. Of course, these transport systems are going to be operating at reduced capacity for the rest of this year if we either go with social distancing or perhaps the wearing of face coverings to allow slightly greater densities. Either way, passenger numbers are going to be way down and you know we need to have some guarantee from the government that those costs can be covered so that we can get the city moving again and therefore the economy 
uh, moving uh, again. So it's a similar theme, but we do need more of a partnership, I think, uh, to, to set the course for public transport going forward. Thanks, Andy. I'll bring Stephen on, on that question as well. Yeah, without that support, um, we can't do anything. So um, the five points that I raised to the Prime Minister on Friday, because I, I, I was speaking on public transport, were that we needed some sort of extended support long after lockdowns ended and, and we're back to some sort of, of new norm. Um, but it's going to be a, a very much extended period until we get back to um, where we were pre-COVID on public transport and our ability to fund public transport. Um, the very fact that Andy touched again on the local authority um, finances and the settlements from local uh, from national governments, that has a direct bearing on their ability to raise or to provide money for us, for us to raise money through the levy mechanism. Uh, and because they've been hit hard, they can't further subsidise public transport through the levy. And that, that's going to be an issue for us going forward. The whole issue about social distancing, uh, again, speaking to the Prime Minister, um, one, please stop the mixed messages, but two, um, we will need to increase services and at the same time we will see reduced incomes with modal shift towards other forms of transport. And so on the increased services, um, depending on if we wear face masks or not, and we'll, we'll touch on that, what we'll, we'll need is perhaps two buses or three buses if we have to try and segregate people because of social distancing. And that has massive additional costs. You know, you can imagine the fare box is going to reduce, but our operating costs are going to continue to increase. I said to him that we need to restore confidence in the public transport network. And that is, of course, we're doing our bit with more cleaning and, and regular cleaning, but also this thing about social distancing and face coverings. Myself and Sadiq Khan very clearly called for face coverings at a very early stage, the government at that stage was saying no, and now they seem to have been more, more receptive to the idea. But we want to see more than Boris Johnson just say, I think face coverings might be a good way forward. We need some advice and guidance. And then the last bit, which is a more philosophical discussion that we'll have to have at some stage, is about um, the commercial transport model, and I think now it's broken. Um, it's not viable for us to run services the way that we previously have, and we can't have operators cherry picking the profitable routes and leaving us to subsidise the other bits. And that's one of the uh, debates that we're going to have um, going into this, you know, release of lockdown, and for very, very. I think there's been an issue with your mic there just at the end, Steve. But um, if you're happy enough, I'll move on to the next question. Give me a push for time. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to um, a question uh, from uh, PA Media, James Cropper. Uh, we'll start with you, Steve, on this one. But the question is for both of you. Part of the Premier League's project restart plan for finishing the current season has been reported to rely on using neutral stadiums to play games. Both your cities are home to large stadiums. Um, that could fit into the Premier League's criteria for such a plan. Have you had any discussions uh, with regard to their aims? And also, if a stadium in your city was in contention for use, would you have concerns that a high-profile event like this could cause a uh, heightened social activity around the actual stadium and risk social distancing measures. Steve, we'll go to you first, then we'll bring in Andy on that one. Well, uh, until we develop a vaccine, it's been tested and it's guaranteed to work, then at some stage there are going to be large scale public gatherings and um, we need to be thinking about what the consequences of those things are. Or, or, or are we going to say that we don't have anything at all for two years? You know, no football, no sports, no concerts, uh, people not going to pub, whatever it might be. So people are going to start getting back to whatever this new norm is. And we need to be thinking that through. And part of that will be around football. 
And for me, um, I think the neutral venues probably is the the, the better um, option. Um, I, I'm not certain that we're going to see what the the question sort of refers to, which is, you know, if the, if one of the games um, was in the West Midlands and it, it, it featured um, Liverpool and uh, Brighton, then I'm, or Everton and Brighton or Man United and Man City and Brighton, I'm not certain that people from the West Midlands might congregate around those football stadia. So that there are things that need to be thought through. Have I been in conversations with um, the football authorities? No, um, but we have spoken to the football clubs uh, and of course they are in ongoing dialogue with the football authorities and, and all the, the bodies, all the stakeholders around this. Ultimately, I think it'll be a police issue and we'll have to see what the advice and guidance from the police will be at that time. But I'm certain that at some stage we are going to, as long as we can reduce the safety factor and the risk factor as far as reasonably practical, then I think we are going to see a return to some sort of programme, sports and other events. Thanks, Steve. Andy, did you have anything you want to add to that point? Um, am I live, Ross? Oh, yes, you okay. are. Um, well, obviously, the Premier League is critically important to both of our cities. Um, I, I think it's a safety first approach, though, because um, there are more implications than just a, a game at a neutral venue. There's people gathering at home to watch it. You know, it. it it's the message it sends out to kids that it's OK to play football again. Um, so I can understand we all want to see it back, but I, I, I just don't think you can kind of rush into a decision ab about this until things are much, are much clearer. Um, so, you know, I know they've got to look at what other leagues are doing around Europe. Most are not returning. So I, I just think it's a safe as much as we'd like to see it. I think it is a, a safety first uh, approach. Um, and I and I say that just just <laughs> without any reference to football uh, rivalries. I just think you know the the game needs is you know people look to it. It sets a standard. Uh, people um, kind of will use it to justify other other behaviour, and and they need to be very very careful. And you know the message um, of restart would I think have a a very big impact on uh, lots of lots of other places. And there's also the question of can you preserve the integrity of the league season if if obviously the games are being played in a different way than they were in the earlier part of the season. So really difficult issues. The Premier League haven't spoken to us, but I'd probably suggest that they do because I think, you know, the views of our police forces uh, as well as our football clubs, I think are, are really crucial in this. Thanks, Andy. I'm going to take Jen Williams and uh, Liam Thorpe's questions together. They're not quite the same topic, but for the sake of time, I, I thought we would do that. Um, Andy, uh, the question to Jen uh, from Jen is: How exposed do you think the GM economy is to the COVID aftershock, or the sorry, the Manchester economy uh, is uh, to the COVID aftershock? Given some of the major engines, the airport, the university, visitors, hospitality are amongst uh, the sectors that could be most affected, uh, and then uh, as well as that from Liam Thorpe. Can there really be any hope for an economic recovery in your regions if individual councils are facing going bust because of a shortfall in government crisis funding? So I'll take Andy first and then Steve and then I'm going to bring in everybody on another question uh, from Capital. OK, thanks Ross. I was going to say maybe Lou wanted to say something on, on this uh, question as well. So maybe if I'd be very brief, um, but I think clearly the economy is exposed, uh, Jem. Um, uh, and there's no getting away from that uh, as long as we don't have a, a deal uh, in place that secures the airport, uh, when we don't necessarily have uh, a, a strong financial foundation beneath our councils, public transport system, um, you know, it, it, it makes recovery look and feel uh, feel harder. So it's why we're making some of these these calls today. You know, the, the health crisis is hitting deprived communities hardest. The economic crisis that follows it will, could do exactly the same. And what it's why we've not wasted any time really in bringing forward this Build Back uh, Better campaign that, you know, the uh, time is of the essence here. And I just stress again, you know, this is a this is meant to be building a, you know, a, a collaborative, positive spirit. And I, again, I put the appeal out for any organisation to get on board with this campaign. 
because of the nature of the risks that you've identified, they are they are huge. And we're going to have to think differently, work differently, support people in different ways through this. Uh, and, um, you know, I don't think any of us should underestimate the scale of the risks, nor, nor indeed the uh, the challenge that lies ahead. Thanks. I'm going to bring in Steve and then uh, Lou or uh, Lauren, we want to come in. Thanks, Ross. Uh, look, absolutely 100% unequivocally, this risks our economic recovery. There is no doubt about it. You, you can't be the Chancellor of the Exchequer and, and stand in Downing Street at one of these press conferences saying, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. I don't know how many people have counted how many times he said, whatever it takes. For councils then to go and gear up to whatever it takes to tackle this coronavirus, for them to get the first tranche of funding, and then which was based on need, which is the right thing to do, and then the second tranche, which was promised to be determined per capita, just spread out willy nilly with no scientific thought to what that actually means. There's, there's it's not a sophisticated approach, and for our areas, that meant that we are about £137 million down and that is not levelling up, that's dragging down, that's dragging back and it's damaging not just our ability for a recovery but it's damaging our economy now today and our councils who have done some sterling work, even recognised by national governments, they've done some brilliant things for them to have the rug pulled from under their feet, I think actually is a disgrace. And, and we, we do try not to be party political on this, but I would hate to think that there's a party political motive or a partisan motive to the funding methodology that's being used to distribute this last tranche of funding. And I just think for our councils to be put in a position, the invidious position that they're in now is a national disgrace. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Lou or Laura, did either of you want to come in on this point? Uh, Lou, perhaps? Yeah, um, just briefly, Ross, I think I think it's such an incredibly important point because the the issue of how strong the foundation is on which we're going to try and build back um, is important. We saw it in the 2007-2008 recession. Uh, arguably, in some senses, we're in a better situation because the banks were arguably in a worse situation because of the austerity and the the state that our, our local authorities and councils have been left in. So I think um, we we know from that experience that the North was cut deeper and was slower to recover. And that's just a fact. And we have to learn from that. And we have to recognise that in terms of the level of investment that's needed across the North to make sure that that isn't the case this time. Thanks, Lou. Um, I'm going to uh... Given the time, uh, I'm going to take a question from Kevin Gopal at the Big Issue North. Um, what will be the probable impact on the northern economy and employees um, of the end of the furloughing scheme? Would you like to see it extended significantly past June? That's also a point that Kevin Fitzpatrick has picked up. Um, what are your thoughts on the Chancellor's comments that the furlough scheme was not sustainable in the longer term? Uh, I was going to go to Andy first on that, uh, then to Steve and then to LEP colleagues. Well, I think it's implicit in a standards led or a safety led release from lockdown that you might have to support some sectors longer than others because some will find it more difficult uh, to um, uh, start work or indeed uh, bring employees back in any great number. So I think what you need is a, a flexible approach to the furlough scheme uh, that goes beyond uh, June in the same way that I was talking about our public transport system needing support beyond June. Uh, it's clear that a lot of businesses will need support that goes uh, beyond uh, beyond June. Um, and I, I was a little worried to hear the comment about it's not sustainable because those businesses aren't sustainable without it. And if you let large parts of the economy go, particularly in leisure and hospitality, well, how do you how do you get the economy going again if so much of it has been lost uh, in this uh, period? So the Chancellor needs to follow through the logic of the furlough scheme and as expensive as it is, it needs to keep going to preserve as much of our economy now uh, so that you know the road to recovery isn't as long and hard as it might otherwise uh, be, that we can we can come back 
uh, more quickly. So that's the appeal that I would make to him, but perhaps also think about linking furlough to good employment standards, the good employment charter that we've developed in Greater Manchester, Steve's Fair Employment Charter. You know, use it as an opportunity to work with people to, to reshape work and improve the quality of work. Uh, it, let's turn it to a, a positive. That, that absolutely would be an example of building back better. Thanks, Andy. We'll bring in Steve um, on that point as well. And um, just very quickly to add, um, if we don't support um, businesses to furlough their workforces for an extended period, period, and certainly in some sectors more than others, companies will go bust and they will make people redundant. And those people who become unemployed will um, cost the country probably more money. So it's in the short term the right thing for us to do and it's just um, that the country and the government need to understand the economics of not extending furlough and once that argument's won then i think we will see some sort of program that's extended thanks steve and um, lou or laura did you want to come in on the, the furlough point uh possibly laura first yeah yeah, yeah great thank you I mean, from a from a visitor economy point of view, the extension of fair loaning is going to be critical to some of those businesses surviving. Um, if we come out of lockdown and we're in a position of social distancing, then for many of those visitor economy businesses, such as our restaurants, our cafes, etc., um, they're going to be down to half the number of covers and therefore they're going to need half their staffing to be able to cover that and they want to be able to keep workforces and keep talent into the city and I think that's going to be a key one for us without the fair loaning scheme uh, extending in some way for some sectors we're going to lose a huge amount of talent out of the city and that's something we need to consider. We also need to consider that my point around seasonality earlier so for a lot of businesses they would make their money in this summer period to cover their staffing costs throughout the winter and they're going to lose that opportunity. So there's a number of issues for the visitor economy that would make fairlow in a really critical issue um, for the, for this sector in particular. Thanks, we'll go to Lou. Yeah, so I think just to echo what Laura's saying really and, and, and what Laura's highlighting there is that as, as we move further into this, we're going to need to think about different sectoral needs, you know, which are going to vary um, uh, across different um, sections of the economy. I think the bottom line is the key thing is to keep people in a job and as much as we can that has to be the goal because we know um we know the slide back if we don't and the long road to recovery there so that's about supporting businesses in um building the best kind of recovery and um, that they can and i think what's missing at the moment although the furlough is welcomed and and has helped businesses um inordinately the the key thing now is that flexibility point that Andy mentions and can we find a way to bleed people back into businesses to help with that recovery process because at the moment it's very black or white people are either in the business or they're out of the business and actually what businesses will need most is that talent and that expertise to help them gradually build back even if those people are, are partly one foot in one foot out for a while and supported by government so i think some form of flexible um, plan which hopefully you know government it, that that's going to be a consistent message from businesses up and down the country so i'm sure i'm sure government's aware of that and is beginning to consider what that solution will be Thanks, Lou. Um, I'm going to go to uh, a final question uh, from Tom Dunn. I want to apologise to those colleagues whose question we haven't got in, but we do have the Greater Manchester News Conference tomorrow. Uh, it's a question from Tom Dunn at 124. Uh, how, uh, for Steve and Andy, how much of an economic impact do you think both areas uh, you oversee will have when the lockdown is lifted and businesses can start again? What plans are in place to help get them kick-started? Uh, and also, as this is the final question, if you do have any final uh, comments, uh, that would be the time. Well, I mean, in terms of the um, you know the economic impact, uh, of course, it it, it is huge. Um, so you know we are thinking through right now every every possible thing we can do to support our businesses. I'll give you one very specific example. Um, we are looking at a world where personal protective equipment will become commonplace, not just in the health and care sector, but on transport, in retail, everywhere. Um, so one thing that we're looking at is how we can uh, talk to our own SMEs, suppliers in Greater Manchester, uh, manufacturers, to see if we can get a system working that really benefits them and creates 
uh, work and jobs um, and that's a specific piece of work that we've got uh, we've got underway um, we, we can't obviously at this stage plan for major events in the city although you know we're really pleased with the um, the streaming platform united we stream and the success that that's had uh, and we want to promote more events in that way to keep uh, the profile of greater manchester high i think the, the key thing i'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, just finish on ross if i may is that you know while we have talked about building back better today we've got to build build back safe um and uh with the 10 leaders of greater manchester last week we we agreed that a safe safe gm would be a very kind of important starting point for us all uh, from where we are at the moment that this is a safe city and city region uh, to visit that you know proper standards will be observed on in workplaces on public transport in hotels when they're back to full operations or restaurants in the universities giving that confidence to our overseas students visitors to the city region so in some ways that's the most important thing i think we can do at this point is to say you know safety is going to be at the heart of everything uh, that we do and it's why i made those comments i just did about the premier the premier league you know that will build back visitor confidence business confidence and i think everything will come from that it's why the leaders of greater manchester tomorrow will debate um, a mass testing system for the city region and we'll say more about that tomorrow it's why we've also been thinking carefully about contact tracing and we do have concerns i have to say about the government signing a national contract uh, to set up a parallel system. Um, th this needs to be done with us and you need to, the government needs to work with us to allow us to enhance uh, a contact tracing system that we can then say gives real uh, confidence to, to people going forward. So, you know, I, I, I appeal to the government to work with us more. You know, we, we, we need to approach recovery um on a on a partnership basis where we're both equals we're both in this discussion and we're building this from the bottom up and sometimes we haven't had that spirit in the last few weeks but we really need it now as we go more seriously into the recovery phase so um you know before we can get to major events or anything else we might do getting those that that safe functioning economy at the heart of our of our um of our plans is is critical and we're working hard on that Thanks, Andy. I'll bring in Steve on the, the question from Tom Dunn, but also to uh, Samit. Yeah, um, thanks, Tom, for the question. I, I think the economic impact will be determined by central government's ability or will to sort out some sort of long term intervention programme, some, some support for either sectors or geographic areas where there are significant problems and of course one of those is the visitor economy that's been mentioned visitor economy as laura said is really important to both of our city regions um, and will be massively impact impacted by things outside of our control so people's ability to get in for instance flying into manchester uh, airport or into john lennon airport or coming in via our port and our plans for a new cruise liner facility all of those things are outside of our um, gift at the moment but they are things that the government will need to to help us with so it's in, it, it it's the government's interventions will be pivotal to how we can start to build our recovery and to the success of those proposals and hopefully as Andy just said there the government will want to work with us we both know our areas better than national government and white old mandarins know our areas we know what it will take but the government can't continue to hit our councils the hardest through austerity and they're not then not fulfill promises about local government financial settlements coming out of covid and at the same time think that that in, in any way will help us to achieve what we all want is to see um, us mitigate the waste excesses of some of the aftershocks of COVID um, to the economy. So I don't know the answer to that one. I, I would just say on, on a final note, you know, I, I mentioned apprenticeships before. If the government wants to look at stuff to give young people hope, it can straight away release some of the massive underspend of the apprenticeship levy funding that we've been asking for. And that can start to kickstart the economy 
obviously those people who get apprentices will be spending money in local economies. That's what we need. We need um, some sort of blue sky thinking from government and to go back to, uh, not to go back rather to what we had, but to, to build back better. They can do this by providing us some, with some funding and some trust and some additional responsibilities. The Prime Minister said with responsibility comes accountability. Well, we're, we stand ready to be accountable. Um, we are due for election in, in 12 months or so, so we will be held accountable, but we can only be held accountable for those things that we have responsibility for and the government needs to trust us. And I welcome them giving us additional powers with additional resource and we can then start to really turn around um, some of the problems that we're all going to face um, certainly in the Liverpool City region I'm looking forward to doing that with our six local authority leaders and so I'll, I'm happy to leave it there Ross um, but thank everybody for giving up their time and obviously apologise for those people that we couldn't respond to the questions that they submitted but happy to do that if they wanted to um, via another forum. Thanks.